and good evening. I'm Stephanie Berugian. Welcome to our post discussion, the show after the show, as they kept referring to it tonight. This is following tonight's Congressional District 21 debate hosted by KGET in Bakersfield. Now, just moments ago, Congressman David Valadeo and TJ Cox both put on the hot seat answering questions on issues impacting voters right here in the Valley. And during the show, we're going to be speaking with KGET's Aton Wallace, along with a panel of political analysts out of Bakersfield. And then we'll have a final wrap up with our esteemed debate moderators, KGET's Jim Scott and KC24's Evan Onstop. But first, we are checking in with a couple of familiar faces for us here in Fresno to get uh, their take on how the two candidates did as they fight to represent the Valley. With the Fresno County and City Republican Women Federated, we have Diane Pierce, who is a familiar face to us, and he's a local attorney and a member of the Fresno County Democratic Party, David Rowell, also familiar. Thank you both for being here tonight. It's a pleasure. We, Thanks for having us. Sure, it's our pleasure to have you. We spoke just a few minutes ago Anything earth-shattering from what you saw during uh, the, the last hour of programming? I, I would characterize it as a, you know, the kind of debate that you see uh, before any serious election. I thought they both had a good grasp of the issues, talked mm -hmm. about their points. Obviously, there were different points of view, but uh, I thought they both did uh, quite well. Diane? Yeah, it was pretty expected. Certainly the topics were ones that you knew were going to be talked about. Um, I think in terms of moving the needle, in the election itself, T.J. Cox would have needed a knockout blow, which he did not get. So as far as the effects of it, I don't think we're going to see anything happen. But the debate itself was pretty standard fare. Well, I wonder, this is the first time uh, the congressman and his challenger met face to face. So if just that in itself gives either one of them a particular advantage, the congressman, of course, seeking his fourth term, so he's pretty seasoned, mm -hmm. and T.J. Cox maybe not as you know familiar with this type of, of setup. Did, do you think that just in itself offered any type of advantage to either side? I think it probably did. I, I thought uh, Congressman Valadale was more seasoned. You could tell that he'd done more sp uh, public speaking than mm -hmm. uh, T.J. Cox. But um, I would hate to think that voters make choices on these critical issues just because some guy looks better on television yeah. than others. I, I, unfortunately, I think, you know, there is some... You never know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not what we'd like, but it may happen. Diane? Yeah, I think uh, David Valadale is very comfortable with these issues. He's obviously been working with them a lot, mm -hmm. as he referenced multiple times, particularly on the water issue. Um, T.J. Cox seemed most comfortable talking about health care. He liked to say that's what he does all the time. Um, but there were certainly no opportunities for him to gain much ground. And I do think that's why they talk about the advantage of incumbency, because it does favor someone who is talking about what they've been doing. Right. And I think that's what we saw tonight, is Valadeo seemed to have a lot more to bring to the table on every single topic, and not just um, what was going on, but a little bit of history with it, of how we got to this point where certain breakdowns were, particularly on immigration, well, and, and he, some about previously. He really did seem to stress, I heard more than once, that Cox did not have an understanding of how things work mm -hmm. in uh, in Washington. I think we're going to be running some tape in a little bit that, that has an example of that. Do you think that uh, is the case, that, well, that I, Cox I, came I across? I think it has to be the case. I mean, uh, Congressman Valadero has been in Congress for a number of years, and T.J. Cox has never been there. Certainly the congressman would have a better grasp of the details of how, how that works. So that doesn't necessarily present itself as a, a disadvantage for the opponent in this particular race? I, I suppose it confers some advantage. You could almost call it an unfair advantage, mm -hmm. though. It doesn't mean that you're, it, it has no relationship to your familiarity with the issues mm -hmm. or or you know, fitting those issues to the needs of your constituents. It just means that you know how the wheels go around in the machine. Right. Yeah. Okay, so they did. Water was the first topic of discussion. Of course, it's an important topic for our area, the whole valley, of course. Um, what the points that um, the congressman and, and Mr. Cox made, what do you think will resonate most with uh, the voters in our area? I wish that we had heard more details. The The question, as I recall, that was put to them was, how important is this memo that President Trump signed? Last and, week. Yeah, and I, I think the, the point that um, T.J. Cox made was that, uh, was a good one, 
the memo is really just a memo. It's not legislation. It's not a comprehensive plan. And mm -hmm. and we all care deeply about water here in the in the valley. We know how important it is. And we it would be nice if we did have a plan. And it, it would be nice if we had something more comprehensive than just a memo saying get this done. All these years, nothing's happened. And a, as Mr. Cox says the Republican Party has got control of all three branches of mm -hmm. the government and they still can't get anything done. So I, I think that's unfortunately something that will hurt uh, Congressman Valadeo. Diane, do you think that was a strong point or do you think that's going to have any impact? That is true. He, he did mention the Republicans yes. controlled Congress and the White House. So mm -hmm. what, you know, show, show us, you know, show us something. Yeah, no. I'm, that was a criticism leveled at the Obama administration when they held all three, you know, as well. So it's it's one of those that goes back and forth. Yes. If you've got them, depending you're going to be criticized on for it. In control. Right. But I think what uh, Congressman Valadeo was able to point out is this was something they'd been working on for a long time. And in fact, he pointed out it was the Obama administration's mm -hmm. departments that had the science that forwarded this to the point where now they just needed someone to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what the benefit of the Trump administration is in terms of this water memo. The other thing to point out is, yes, it is a memo. But part of that memo did ask Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke, to publish it in the Federal Register, which gives it more teeth in terms of the hierarchy of executive orders. So it is more than just a memo. Just There's a something to it. Yeah. Right. There is something to it. And it's really just trying to grease some wheels to get the ball rolling on different things. And there were short terms identified in the beginning of it, 30 days and 40 days, to look at some of these programs and try and figure out how we can move them forward rather than letting them be stalled by some of the environmental regulations and things like that, impact reports that they've been suffering from and languishing mm -hmm. because we haven't been able to get them going. So I think there are going to be impacts. No, they're not this week. No, they're not even next week. Mm -hmm. But hopefully we will see some of these uh, wheels starting to turn and the ball getting rolling. And I think there's good reason to be optimistic that it, it will provide some benefit. All right. Well, we shall see on that. Let's turn to immigration and that migrant caravan that was part, uh, definitely discussed tonight. T.J. Cox said he supports a border wall. That was kind of surprising. I know he did elaborate further on that, but let's listen in to some sound about an exchange that happened after that. I do favor a border wall, but nothing out of concrete and brick and mortar. I mean, I build a lot of things like that. I mean, there's technology available that can be doing cheaper and much more efficient. And the fact is, if we have comprehensive immigration, do we really need a border wall when people are here legally and we know if they're here legally and they have the opportunity to go, to go back and forth? The issue is to make sure that whoever is here is here legally. And a policy that meets our workforce needs doesn't tear apart our families, and certainly not one that's going to end up with kids being in cages. Mr. Valadeo, for the record, do you favor a border wall? I support securing our border. And again, a total lack of understanding of what's going on. Uh, uh, a wall a is a part wall? of that. I was going to get to that. Okay. So when you look at the bill, the, the proposal out there to actually secure the border, there are parts that require an actual structure because of what is going on around there. There's a community on one side and buildings on the other. It's literally like crossing the street. So infrastructure there makes total sense. There are areas where it makes no sense to build a wall and so that's where some of the technology comes in. But to say that just because we pass immigration there's no need to secure the border is someone again who doesn't understand the threats facing our nation. Really, neither of them said, let's build a big, long border wall. So yeah. that I, I think they, you know, it needed a little bit more uh, explanation on that. But how do you think they both came out, or either one came out on that topic? David? You know, I, I think uh, when we talk about the border wall, you should probably start off with some definitions because it's not <laughs> clear what you're talking about. I think. Well, we know Ms. Uh, President Trump would like to build a right. miles when, long. When you're talking about the border wall, what I think I understand, and most people understand, is the the thousand mile long, forty foot tall wall that President mm -hmm. Trump says Mexico is mm -hmm. going to pay for, and, and that's the border wall. And clearly, Trump and I don't know, maybe three or four other people think that that's a good idea, but most people don't. Talking, but and you also heard them saying, I, I just find it so offensive. Uh, Congressman uh, Valdeo said it. Democrats just want open borders. They want everybody to come in. No, nobody says that. Mm. Everybody wants secure borders, you know. But secure borders doesn't mean a border wall. It doesn't mean the thing that Trump is talking about, and it it doesn't mean ripping p families apart and putting kids in cages. Secure borders. How do we do that? Let's let's decide on a good technology to do that. If there's areas where we need a fence or a wall, then I'm sure we'll have those in those areas. But 
that's not a border wall, and I don't think that anybody except, you know, a few isolated people want a border wall. Oh, Diane? <laughs> no, I think there's uh, a couple different points here. One is that they're so, sort of saying the same thing about they, this. I, I kind of thought know, the same way. Border. We need yeah, secure borders borders. and comprehensive yes. immigration reform, and where a wall is necessary, let's have a physical brick and mortar wall, but that doesn't make sense for the entire stretch of the border. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I think as far as President Trump's rhetoric on that, I think part of that goes to, if you listen to him throughout the campaign in 2016, he talks in sound bites things for people to grab onto mm -hmm. and understand and be like, I'm with him on that, I'm for that. And I think that's where the idea of the physical wall makes sense, is because when you say, I'm building a wall, we're building a wall, we're going to have a wall, people really understand what that means. Like when you try to get into everyone's the, attention. Yeah, and when you try and get into the weeds and the nuance of how much of it is brick and mortar, how much of it is fencing, how much of it is you know strategic patrolling, and yeah. how much of it is technology, that's when you're going to lose people. And so I think what we're seeing and what what a lot of these promises made promises kept from President Trump has seen is you take these campaign stump speeches, you put them through Capitol Hill, and now we start to see what progresses from that. And it's not exactly how it was interpreted from the campaign, but now we're getting it into the manageable, understandable, yeah. this is how it occurs. Clearly, there's in plenty of work to be done. <laughs> and, and Diane sounds so reasonable about it. I wish we had more, you know, reasonable points of view. Unfortunately, I think the process that you're describing is, um, you, you say Trump talks in these sound bites. I think what he talks in is dog whistles, you know, and he keeps using this rhetoric because it does spin up his base on issues that don't have anything really to do with border security and protecting our borders. It has to do with other issues. Well, but, clearly, again, a lot of work to be done. We'll be watching, of course, to see how this election turns out and all the others coming up in November. The discussion is going to continue in Bakersfield. Let's uh, thank you so much, Diane. David, we appreciate your input tonight. Let's now go to KGET's Aton Wallace for more analysis. Diane, David, and Stephanie, thank you so much. And our friends in Fresno, we'd like to welcome you here to KJET TV 17 Studios, where we're broadcasting live from. This is Aton Wallace here with 17 News. I'm joined to my left by Republican 17 political news analyst, Kathy Abernathy, and on our Democratic side, Dr. Mark Martinez. Thank you both for being here tonight. Sure. Thank it's you. It's great to have you both. So, Kathy, I want to begin with you. First question right off the bat, who do you think won? Well, I have to say, Congressman Valadeo, if you've watched him over the years, I thought, I hadn't really heard him speak recently, and I thought he did an excellent job. He's very matured in this job. He's, he knows what Congress does and how it can do it, and he's, I think he's been very successful also at knowing the district. But I thought the most telling question tonight that really exposes the problem for a Democrat candidate in this seat was about water, because the problem for water has been his party. They are composed of the environmentalists, so-called environmentalists that really don't want growth. They're really starving Central California for water. And so the question was to um, Mr. Cox was, well, so your party's been the problem for water. So what can you do? And that's the whole thing. Nancy Pelosi is not fighting to get the Central Valley water. And the constituents in David Valadeo's seat, their careers, their jobs, their industry is agriculture. And agriculture needs water. And I think that until we get a Democrat party that cares less about the lawsuits, which is the lawyer side of it, and the uh, environmental side, because that's what stops progress. As Mr. Valadeo said, you have to figure out how to write a bill so you can't be sued every five minutes. And so I, th I think that was really important. And to focus on that, I thought that was an excellent way to point the, the situation in that congressional seat. Mark? Yeah, l without a doubt, T.J. Cox crushed this. I, he made it very clear that the Republicans have been in po uh, power for the last couple of years. They can't get anything through. Um, they have a, a minor uh, a success with uh, water accomplishment, if you can call it that, with uh, the recent announcement that we just had. But the reality is, is that, look, the problems we have with water are storage and, and the fact that it hasn't been raining in the state of California. But, but I think T.J. Cox scored really big on the issues of immigration. I think he scored really big on health care. I think he scored big pointing out, and, and this is one of the things that we didn't get enough uh, coverage of or in, in any real questions, the Republican Party is going to go after Medicare. They're going to go after Social Security. T.J. Cox tried to bring that up, but at the end of the day, if you want and, and want to keep your Medicare, if you want to keep Social Security, Republicans are going after that because they gutted the bank uh, 
uh, giving $1.6 trillion in tax cuts to the very wealthy in this country. And, and I wish they had talked a little bit more about the Republicans going after Social Security because that's what, what's going to happen. Social Security and Medicare are on the chopping block. And let's stick on immigration for a moment. Uh, Mr. Cox did say that he technically would support a wall, but not under uh, the concrete uh, the plan that, that would be right now. And he did criticize uh, C Congressman McCarthy's plan, saying that it was too expensive. What do you have to respond to that? Well, isn't that funny that when we ever get to talking about doing something on the border, that then it's, oh, well, that's not good. You know, it's, they wanted something, then you offer them something, and then they don't want that something. Uh, but uh, I do want to mention the, Repu the Democrats have been saying that the Republicans are going to cut Social Security and Medicare for time immemorial. I don't know how many more times it can be said as, as an agenda. It never has been. That both those are way, way spending has increased. 60% of the federal budget goes to the elderly and to the non-poor, a uh, non-elderly poor. 60% of this budget. So I don't know how much more you can do and say that it's for the elderly because they're getting that much, 40% of the federal budget right now. And that's besides us having to do everything else with it. So we'll put that to rest a little bit. But um, the, the important thing about the border is what we're seeing right now on television, the storm of people, which is, a lot of it is theatrical to me. Uh, because, you know, when I watch the uh, uh, Christians in Syria who are basically tossing three-year-olds over barbed wire to get them to safety and what they looked like compared to this group that's pretty well dressed and clean and they had Pepsis and, and Subway sandwiches today, uh, it's, it's not what I call a refugee. So I think that uh, this whole little show is kind of pointing out people willing to push advantage. There's Venezuela, whoever's behind this whole thing. Uh, we need, it, we have a system if they need to beef it up so that it moves a little faster, fine. But we don't change rules to make other people in other countries happy. We make rules for our country. Here's the problem, uh, and I think T.J. Cox nailed it when he said we're, we're presenting and proposing a 12th century solution to a 21st century problem. Look, we, we have a lot of solutions that go beyond simply building this ridiculous wall. Um, I, I mentioned one time in a debate with the, on the Ralph Belly show uh, with Kevin McCarthy that we can start talking about things like creating the NAFTA visa. We, we, can, we can do a number of things that, 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 that doesn't, uh, doesn't a, uh, appeal to the most punitive elements of our, of, of our community and our society. But he, here's something else with, uh, with what we're seeing. That, you know, people want to take a look at the, that so-called caravan that's coming, to, the people who are seeking asylum. The reality is, you know, Ellis Island regularly dealt with five to six to seven thousand seven thousand people a day. I mean, and, and, and if you're looking at it and the same that the Border Patrol can't deal with five, six, seven thousand people, then 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 what you're saying is that 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 what happened a hundred years ago when we had no real technology is something that we can't deal with today. And and think about the last time we had the so-called caravan. The, uh, caravan. There was a couple of thousand people. Yeah, about three percent of those people actually got either asylum because of family or because they had some type of relationships over here or whatever it was. The point is, is that a lot of those people, if they do ever make it to the border, are going to end up staying in Mexico or going back home. And so what we're seeing here right now is a lot of scaremongering, scaremongering and the reality is, is that we don't have to be a nation living in fear. We're all Americans, live it, and, and, and more importantly, embrace being an American. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to carry. You don't have to get in a, in a fetal position simply because right, well Donald Trump is afraid of, that, of that's the world. The, that's the point. We are the Americans. They're not. Okay, and my father. Yes, they are spent, Central America, me, my South father, America. My North father. America. My father spent two months at Ellis Island when he was two years old, and he came legally. And he had a brother who had uh, chicken pox, and so they wouldn't let them go past until that was over. So th there were rules, and, and, and we someone would say we shouldn't have children separated, but my father's father had to go live somewhere else So at that time. So that's, there, we have rules, but again, uh, we are the Americans. The ones trying to get in have to do it legally. And, and I want to stay with Kathy for a moment. We don't have a lot of time, and I want to move on to health care. Health care was a big part of this debate. And actually, Mr. Cox called Congressman Valadeo's vote on the American Health Care Act, quote, just so reckless. What do you think about what he said? Well, the, the Obama plan for health care would be bankrupting the country. You can't say that people are going to get free health care. It just doesn't work. Okay, What we need is more competition. If you had more medical schools being built, if we produced a thousand more doctors, we aren't building more med schools. There's plenty of reasons why health care is too expensive. The solution isn't to throw more tax money at it.
Right. <laughs> Nobody is asking for free health care. As, as a matter of fact, what we're looking at, and, and, and the best of all worlds would be something like a single payer system. The reality is we pay more per capita than any industrialized country in the world. It's not even close. Two, three times what France and the rest of these countries pay for. And what happens is that is that we need to take it. What needs to happen is that we need to take an assessment. We are probably the most inefficient country when it comes to dealing with health care. And, 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 and here's the problem that we really have. The Republicans are saying that they're not going to deal with preconditions. They're not going to take them. That's what they're saying right now. They need your vote. The reality is they're going to take away, or they're going to end up taking away a good deal of your health care. And it's going to start with preconditions. They're going, to, they're going to say, all right, let's go back to the past. Then think about this. In eight or, or nine states before Obamacare came in, if you, if you were beaten, if you, were, if you had been beaten by your husband, the fact that you were once beaten meant that you were, had a precondition. You could literally be taken off your health care rolls because the precondition was you were beaten previously by your husband. So think about this. You save money. Th these type of preconditions that we're talking about, uh, the Republicans are going to remove them. Don't look at what they're saying today. Look at what they've done. They tried to repeal health care. Pre-existing conditions Obamacare are part of the Republican orders. plan. Nobody has said they're stopping that. And, that's what they're and saying no now. health insurance that's company saying is right saying now. it and, either. And, our, and so as that's our silly. As our viewers can see, it is a contentious topic. I quickly want to ask, speaking of contentious topics, negative campaign ads. Negative campaign ads were a big part of this uh, debate tonight. In fact, Mr. Cox said Valadale should, quote, be ashamed of himself. And then when Mr. Valadale was asked whether he uh, stands by his ads, he said, yes. Do you think Mr. Valadale should be ashamed of himself for the negative campaign ads? Like, like I've said many times, the person who is uh, attacked on their voting record, on whatever their performance has been in Congress, they may say that's a negative campaign ad because it makes them look poor. But are we not supposed to communicate that to the voters? Hey, by the way, this candidate, he voted to raise your taxes. All right? You, that's, your opponent will say that's negative. Now, dirty campaign ads is different. That's when you talk about what your opponent did in high school, okay, at a high school party. That's kind of really a dirty ad because who cares what he did in high school? So the point is that you, you present ads either for your candidate or about what's wrong with your opponent. You want to call that negative? Yeah, it's negative for, for the opponent, but it sure is positive for you. Mark, I'll give you the last word. Well, I like the way Kathy is just still trying to cover for Kavanaugh. Here, here, here's the reality. Uh, uh, the, the type of campaigning we, ha we, we have today, uh, uh, just let's be blunt, we've seen this historically, and we can go back 200 years, we can go back to Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, all this. The, the reality is, is that what we're seeing today is, is really high-tech, dirty campaigning, and, 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 it, and we have it effectively because it still works. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Republican, Democrat, Independent, um, uh, the ugly tactics work, um, and, and it depends on what your overall strategy is for the political campaign. If you want to drive down uh, voter participation. We, everybody knows negative campaigning helps to do that. And, and I sad to say both, both, uh, both sides do it. All right. Mark Martinez, 17 News political, uh, Democratic political uh, analyst, and Kathy Abernathy, Republican political analyst for 17 News. Thank you both for being here. Very much appreciate that. Meanwhile, I would like to toss it over to my colleagues, Jim Scott of 17 News and Evan Ossad of KC24. Let's turn it right back up to them upstairs in our KGET debate studios. All right. Thank you very much, Eitan Wallace, and always a lively debate between Kathy Abernathy and Mark Martinez. You can be rest assured. You, you get treated to that a lot, don't you? Yeah, we do. We do. Well, so good. What so were your good. reflections on uh, the debate tonight? I thought it was a good debate. You know, we've done a few of these together. I think this yep. was our fourth debate that we've right. done, three of them Valadeo debates, and I thought... T.J. Cox, uh, I, I thought I thought T.J. Cox held his own, to be honest, uh, compared to maybe uh, other debates. Here, here's the thing with here's the thing with David Valadeo. He's gotten better at this the longer he's been in Congress. I agree with that. And not just on the debates. It's, you know, when he comes in to talk to you for your political show or for mm -hmm. newscasts, he's more comfortable on camera, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, and I feel like that shows, and it continues to show. Um, but I thought T.J. Cox made his case. I thought he was direct. As, as you were pointing out, this was his first debate ever. Yeah, this is debate his ever. first debate. I thought he was very articulate. Um, I, did, I don't think he seemed intimidated at all. Yes, that's a good Even point. Even by the mere stature of David Valadeo, who is yeah. a very tall guy. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> but you know, he is tall. I think he answered the questions. He gave substantive answers to the questions. I think what I enjoyed the most about this debate was having the opportunity to question the candidates about the claims they've made in their attack ads. Yeah. Uh, because that's what stood out in this race so far. To the average person just watching TV at night, 
they are seeing these attack ads. I mean, yeah. every single commercial break. I'm sure it's the same down here in Bakersfield. And the voters, you don't get to ask those questions. Voters don't get a seat. They 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 listen to those ads, and then they have to decide fact or fiction. <laughs> well, we got to ask them directly tonight uh, whether it was fact or fiction. And I think that you know a couple things came out. I am. Um, you know about the 99 percent voting record uh, David Valadeo has with respect to the policies the president uh, is pushing mm -hmm. uh, and we looked at you know the analytics uh, 538.com crew looked at 92 votes that Congress made since 2017 and in that time there were over 1200 votes and so mm -hmm. those are the kind of things you don't hear about and we you know David Valadeo called it cherry picking and, and DJ and Cox said yeah we cherry pick we cherry pick the meaningful votes right <laughs> on policy yes policy votes and not procedural votes yeah. right so I thought that was very interesting, interesting. and and the age tax that uh, T.J. Cox alleged that uh, David Valadeo was pushing for on health care. Uh, you know, David Valadeo shot that one down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought it was, I thought it was interesting to see him trade punches, uh, you know, and, and separate the, you know, the meat from the sauce, if mm -hmm. you will, on, on a lot of these political ads where, like it or not, hyperbole and negativism still works in politics today. Unfortunately. Unf unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I think is when you, and I'm curious about your process, because before the debate, this is how, this is how it worked. Jim and I, we contacted each other, we talked on the phone, and then we started sending emails back and forth to each other, and it was just right. kind of a, all right, well, hey, you put some questions together, I'll put some questions together, we'll throw them into a big pot and make jambalaya, and then see what bites we think works best. And, and so, what I, when we all know the issues. Everybody watching these debates know, all right, it's water. Mm -hmm. It's immigration. Mm -hmm. It's health care. But how do we ask these questions in a way that's going to challenge right. the candidate? And elicit to maybe, some candid answers. Yes, and to get away from, from, from the canned right. uh, talking, talking points, points right. that we hear so often. And, mm -hmm. and I thought for... I felt pretty that you and I were pretty successful in a lot of that. That it brought out some, some legitimate answers and some answers in which you could tell they had to think before they answered, mm -hmm. and they had to kind of, all right, where am I going to go with this? I can't just answer in my, in my, in my typical way. It was, uh, you know, just nice to hear. Uh, David Valadeo is a pretty well-known commodity yeah. within the 21st District. Uh, T.J. Cox is a newcomer. And it was nice to hear him talk about his views and to learn, you know, in real time, I'm learning along with you and the voters out there, mm -hmm. what this man is about what he stands for and his views on the uh, the hot button issues here in the Central Valley and uh, for that I think it was an hour of time well spent so let's look ahead now we're very close to the election the Demo the numbers the voter registration numbers as always in the 21st are in the Democrats favor but that has never mattered so far since Valadeo has been in office no. and TJ Cox he wanted more debates he wanted to do more than just this one. Understand? And he's not going to get it. This was the one and only debate that he's going to get. Was it enough? Were enough people watching? We hope so, right? Our bosses hope so. Um, and, and, and was that enough to maybe raise his name recognition out there to make a difference on election day? After the debate, we were just talking to him, and he said, I don't know if you've seen the latest polls. We feel very good about them. He says it's getting tired. He says it's getting tired. He goes, we feel very good. We're in a really good spot. We'll see if that holds on election day. It, it's, it's just who turns out to vote, and which message is resonating with the people who really say, I don't know. I don't care about Democrat, Republican. Just tell me. I just want to see somebody and feel like, yes, I believe in this person. Well, obviously, the Democratic Party believes in T.J. Cox because his ads are covering the airwaves. And I, I would say I would be willing to bet that it's almost a two-to-one run against Valadeo mm -hmm. and the ads that he's running. Mm -hmm. So the Democratic Party is still pouring well, money into this race, well, and they it, see it must be close enough that they haven't backed off the race yet. Well, so we'll see. actually, just recently, the DCCC actually did pull their funding. The, mm -hmm. the, uh -huh. the DCCC pulled the remainder of the funding for the Bakersfield and Fresno markets, and that, that includes everything. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know exactly what that entails. That's normally not a good thing, but we'll see exactly where that goes. I think it's going to be a sprint to the end. Valadeo has never had the luxury of coasting to the finish line well, on an no, election he day. He hasn't. And T.J. Cox will definitely have to push as well. Well, I know one thing. We gave our, we gave our viewers some information uh, that you're not going to get from watching attack ads on television. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, you have to do your homework, but we hope that this would help you yeah. uh, in preparing to cast that all-important vote on November 6th. Can I do a little quick plug? Because this Talk was away, my friend. You've had so many debates and forums. <laughs> this was your last one. Yeah, this would make nine. I, oh my goodness. So we've had a lot of forums. We got two congressional debates. Yeah. This one, and then on Tuesday, up in up in Fresno, we're going to be doing Jim Costa, the Democrat, versus Elizabeth Hang, the Republican. A lot of people. Elizabeth Hang making a lot of noise. And Jim Costa, Nationally. one of the original blue dog Democrats. Yep, absolutely. Oh, and they had the graphic ready for hey, me. Hey, look at that. Wow. Man, we got some pros in yeah, the booth, that's for go. sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so join us on the 30th. That's Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. Again, that is live in prime time uh, uh, on KC24 as well as online. And the fact that you're just watching right now, thank you for, for participating in Absolutely. the process. I it, concur with that. It, it makes, us, yeah. makes, us really have, makes us know that the hours that we spend on this sort of stuff isn't just going circling down the drain to deaf ears. It's just too bad we only get to get together every two years, or is it? <laughs> It's true. Yeah. You'll, you'll yeah. probably, at the end of this uh, election cycle, we'll probably all take a big, long breath and uh, take a, a year away from the politics. Well, we never get away from the politics, do you? Well, the you thing know. is, after the election, do our political shows, our weekend political shows, do they still run the next week yeah, and every weekend do. after they that? Do. They do. Yes, they do. And all politics is local, so we'll always have something to talk hey, about. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Always good working with right, you, sir. You too, I appreciate it. Right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We appreciate it. Have a wonderful night. And again, keep that conversation going in those comments down low. Keep it civil, please. Yes. Please. And do please. your homework. Go out and make an informed choice at the polls. Good night.